Aquarium lighting can be one of the most confusing aspects for beginners in the hobby. With so many different lighting types on the market and several commonly used but often misunderstood terms, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. That's why I decided to create this video to help people better understand what to look for in an aquarium light for their planted tank. Instead of focusing on a specific product, I'll cover important terminology and variables that apply to all lights, helping you make the best choice for your tank. As always, if you prefer reading, I've linked a fully sourced, detailed blog post in the description. To kick things off, let's go over some of the most popular types of aquarium lighting used in the hobby today. First, we have LED lights, which are arguably the best option for most people, particularly on the freshwater side of the hobby. They're efficient, long-lasting, and often highly customizable. In my opinion, LED lights are the go-to choice for most hobbyists because they're generally more affordable to buy and require less power to run while also offering superior lighting intensity compared to other types. Next we have T5 fluorescent lights. These provide higher light intensity than other fluorescent options but tend to dim over time. While T5 lights still have their place in the hobby, modern LED units have overtaken them in almost every way. Then there are T8 fluorescent lights which offer lower light intensity than T5s but are usually cheaper to run. They can be suitable for low light plants that fall into the easy category but can struggle with other plants. Next up are metal halide lights which remain popular on the saltwater side of the hobby. However, for freshwater tanks, LED lights outperform metal halides in nearly every aspect from efficiency to adjustability. Finally, there are grow light bulbs which have recently gained popularity thanks in part to Nanoscape's use of them in his nano tanks. These lights can work well in dirted tanks setups but require both a bulb and a light stand which can increase costs, especially in Europe where they tend to be pricier than in the US. It's also worth mentioning that fluorescent T12 and incandescent bulbs are now banned in many countries due to their inefficiency compared to other options. While some of these older lighting types still have niche applications, modern LED lights outperform them for the average hobbyist. As LED technology continues to advance, this gap will only grow wider while the prices of LED lights continue to fall, so if you are new, I highly recommend an LED light. For anyone setting up their first planted tank with low light plants, I highly recommend the budget-friendly Siora SR616 light. It's been well received in the community, boasting over 3,500 reviews on Amazon with an average rating of 4.5 stars. I personally use it on all of my low light tanks. You'll find an affiliate link as well as a link to my full review view of the light in the description. If you're looking for a moderate intensity option for medium category plants or even some advanced plants, the Higer 957 is an excellent budget-friendly choice. This light also has a great reputation with over 4,400 reviews on Amazon and an average rating of 4.5 stars. I currently own four of them and they're perfect for plants that require a bit more power, though they're not essential for the low light plants that beginners typically start with. Still, Still, I know a lot of people like to understand what they are actually buying, so I want to cover some commonly used terms when looking to buy aquarium lights. Lumen count is often highlighted on aquarium light sales pages, but it's important to understand that lumens measure the total output of the light, including wavelengths that plants cannot use for photosynthesis. A helpful way to think about lumens is as a measurement of how bright the light appears to the human eye, particularly when it's first emitted from the lighting unit. While lumens do include some wavelengths beneficial for plants, they're not a direct indicator of plant growth efficiency. That said, lumens can still provide a very rough guideline for choosing a light. Here's a table you can use to estimate the appropriate lumen range based on the types of plants you plan to grow in your aquarium. Next, let's talk about Kelvin and colour temperature, which are also commonly listed on aquarium light sales pages. Colour temperature is measured in Kelvin on a scale ranging from 1000 to 10,000. Lower Kelvin ratings produce light with more red, orange and yellow tones, giving it a warmer appearance, while
while higher ratings lean towards blue and violet tones, resulting in a cooler look. For most people, a rating between 5000 and 6500 Kelvin is ideal as it closely mimics natural daylight. While the slightly higher red and blue wavelengths in all white LED lights may have a minor impact, colour temperature primarily comes down to personal preference, whether you prefer a warmer or cooler look for your aquarium. Next, let's talk about PAR or photosynthetically active radiation, which is a useful metric because it measures the amount of light in the 400 to 700 nanometer range that plants can use for photosynthesis. While PAR is widely considered the most reliable way to evaluate an aquarium light's performance for planted tanks, very few manufacturers include it on their product pages and even when they do, some brands can be misleading. For example, the Superfish Scaper range is popular in the hobby and many vendors list a PAR value of 269 for these lights. However, this number alone is almost meaningless, as manufacturers can take readings directly below the light, something that doesn't reflect where the plants actually sit in relation to the light. Compare this to the higher 957, where the PAR value on its Amazon.com product page is provided along with the distance from the light where the reading was taken. This makes it a much more useful and transparent measurement. In short, if a light lists a PAR value without specifying the distance at which it was recorded, the number is almost useless and can usually be ignored. Here's a chart you can use to compare PAR ratings and match them to the types of plants you plan to grow in your tank. Next, we have LUX, sometimes referred to as illuminance, which measures how much light actually reaches a specific surface. Like lumens, LUX takes into account all wavelengths of light, not just those that plants can use for photosynthesis. As a result, LUX is best used as a way to gauge how well a light will illuminate your aquarium overall and how it will appear to the human eye. Finally, we have watts, which used to be a more reliable way to measure the performance of older lighting types mentioned earlier in the video. However, it's not as useful today. Advancements in LED technology have made it possible for lights to produce significantly more light while consuming fewer watts. Nowadays, watts are better viewed as a cost efficiency metric, helping to estimate how many lumens or micromoles of light your fixture produces per watt of energy used. To quickly summarize, lumens, kelvin and lux indicate how the light will make your tank look to the human eye. PAR measures the light usable for photosynthesis and watts show how the light impacts your energy bill. Next up I want to go over the actual spectrum of the light as this can also be confusing and depending on your budget the best option can change. Let's start with white LED lights as they are typically the default option included in entry level aquarium kits. White LEDs can be very budget friendly but there are also plenty of high end options available depending on your specific needs. Most white LED lights use the white phosphor system where manufacturers create a blue LED and coat it with phosphor to produce white light. There's also an RGB white light system which combines red, green and blue chips within a single LED to create white light. However, this technology is rarely used because green LED efficiency is currently a bottleneck. That said, the RGB system has the potential to significantly improve white LED performance in the future. There's a lot of debate about whether white LEDs can grow aquatic plants but this often misses the mark by focusing on the colour of the LEDs rather than the PAR rating of the light. White LEDs emit all wavelengths so they provide everything plants need for photosynthesis. The issue is that many entry level white LED lights are designed purely for aesthetics in non-planted tanks meaning they tend to have low PAR ratings restricting plant growth. There are countless examples on social media. YouTube and forums of high-end white LED lights like the Chihiro's A2 series successfully supporting growth in easy, medium and even advanced category plants. One potential drawback of white LEDs is that red plants may appear more brownish rather than vibrant red so keep this in mind when choosing a light for your tank. Moving on to full spectrum lights and first I want to clear up a common misconception about the term RGB. Just because a light is labelled as RGB doesn't mean it's full 
full spectrum. As I mentioned earlier, RGB chips can be used to create white light by combining red, green and blue, but they can also be used individually for their respective colours. This versatility allows RGB chips to serve different purposes depending on the design of the light. If your goal is to grow plants, avoid lights that come with remote controls focusing on multiple colour options like this. These are aesthetic RGB lights with low PAR ratings designed to change your tank's colour at night rather than support plant growth. Instead, look for lights marketed as full spectrum which are specifically designed to mimic natural sunlight by providing all the wavelengths plants need in optimal amounts. They usually have a remote control like this that focuses on intensity and duration settings rather than colour adjustments. Full spectrum lights typically use a combination of white, red, green and blue LEDs but may be supplemented by other colours. This setup provides balanced wavelengths for plant growth. Here's a table outlining the key benefits of each wavelength and how they help plants thrive. You might wonder why you should choose a full spectrum light when white LED lights already contain all the necessary wavelengths for plant growth. The reason is efficiency. While specific research is limited, some sources suggest that dedicated LEDs for specific colours can deliver more of a particular wavelength while consuming far less power than white LEDs, which need to produce a broad spectrum. In simpler terms, each red, green or blue LED in a full spectrum light helps reduce energy consumption as fewer white LEDs are needed to achieve the same plant growth benefits. This means lower running costs for your aquarium lighting. The specific light requirements of the plants you want to grow will influence your choice. But as an example, the Seora SR616 light linked in the description is a cheap full spectrum option that includes a basic control unit. If you only have one or two planted tanks, this could work out cheaper than using white LED shop lights while also having lower energy costs in the long run. I also want to touch on WRGB lights, which are becoming increasingly popular in the hobby, especially as many high-end aquascapers use them. However, things aren't always as straightforward as they seem. Pinning down a clear definition of what a WRGB light actually is can be tricky. Generally, most people agree that a WRGB light is a full spectrum light with four independent control channels allowing you to adjust your white, red, green and blue LEDs separately to suit your setup. These lights are typically high-end and far more expensive than anything I use in my fish room so you'd expect them to deliver exactly what's advertised. However, it's essential to read the fine print carefully. For example, if we look at the Chihiro's WRGB 2 Slim and WRGB 2 10th edition, they're clearly labelled as having 3-in-1 RGB LEDs, meaning they only offer adjustable red, green and blue channels. On the other hand, the WRGB 2 Pro is advertised as a 4-in-1 WRGB LED light with adjustable white, red, green and blue channels. This isn't a typo as support confirms it in this support thread where a customer was rightly expected that fourth white adjustable channel as they are labelled as being WRGB only to be told he bought an expensive RGB light. So if you're considering investing in one of these high-end lights, make sure to read the fine print and do thorough research to ensure you're getting exactly what you want. Now let's move on to photo period or the length of time you have your aquarium lights on each day. Getting this balance right is crucial as too much light increases the risk of algae while too little light can cause problems for your plants. Finding the ideal photo period for your tank often requires some trial and error since factors like PAR, plant types, nutrient levels and water flow all play a role. To help you get started, here's a table with some general photo period suggestions based on different aquarium setups. Personally, I keep my lights at full intensity for about six hours a day with a gradual ramp up and ramp down period to avoid startling my fish. It's also worth mentioning photo periodism where plants thrive when exposed to consistent day-night cycles leading to healthier growth. Thankfully, most modern LED lights include built-in timers to automate this process, ensuring your lights turn on and off at the same time each day. If your light doesn't have a timer, you can easily use a plug-in timer compatible with your country's socket and set it up to maintain a consistent
consistent schedule. It's also worth briefly touching on the Daily Light Integral DLI method, which I haven't personally used yet, but plan to try in future tanks. This method measures the total power your plants receive over a 24 hour period, allowing you to fine tune your light's intensity and photo period for optimal plant growth. For example, instead of running your lights at full intensity for six hours a day, you could reduce the intensity to 50% and extend the duration to 12 hours. This approach supports the needs of certain sensitive plants while minimizing the risk of algae in some tanks. MD Fish Tanks often mentions running his lights for 12 hours a day and people question how he doesn't have many algae issues, but the DLI method makes this possible by balancing light intensity and duration. Let me quickly share how you can get a rough idea of whether a specific light will support the plants you're considering for your aquarium. My approach is simple, I usually head to plant nursery databases like Tropica or Denali, look up the plant I'm interested in and check its category and lighting requirements. From there, I reference a lumen or par suggestion chart for the plant category, make sure the light is able to meet its needs and give it a try. Keep in mind that several external factors such as nutrient levels, water parameters, plant eating fish and CO2 injection can also affect plant growth. So even if your light should theoretically support a plant, it doesn't guarantee success. If you're starting your first planted tank, it's best to stick with easy category plants as they're far more forgiving and beginner friendly. I know that's a lot to take in, so I just want to remind viewers of my supporting blog post linked in the video description. Anyway guys, that brings the video to an end. I hope it's been helpful. Thanks for watching and have a great day.